Good morning and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of High Point, North Carolina, and this week's online worship service. We are so glad that you have joined us. My name is Lee Zemer, and I'm the transitional pastor here at the church. Now today we conclude our series of sermons, reflecting on God's call to us to be generous people. Now we've been exploring John Wesley's teaching on the Christian use of money. And we have looked at earning all we can and saving all we can. And today we finish up with giving all you can. And consider that one of God's intentions for our lives is to be conduits through which God can bless others. Now we do have two in-person worship services every Sunday. Our first worship contemporary service is held at 9 a.m. in the Family Life Center. And our traditional service is held at 11 a.m. in the sanctuary. Now today is our Commitment Sunday. When we ask all those who are touched by our ministry to make a giving commitment for 2022. Now to those of you who are worshiping with us online, I ask that you would prayerfully consider including First Presbyterian Church High Point in your giving plans for next year. Now we have an online form to make it easy for you to let us know. And you can find it under the Give tab on our church website, firstpreshp.org. And now let us turn to this morning's worship. May the peace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Please join together in our call to worship. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us worship our faithful God. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray together, confessing our sin before God. O oh God, commitment scares me. Whether the commitment is of money, time, or ability, I raise hundreds of what-if questions in my mind. Help me to place my trust in you rather than in myself. Convince me that anything given to you out of obedience will be blessed and supplied by you. Today may I choose once again to serve you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn only Christ? And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone then who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this day that you've blessed us with and the privilege we have to gather together around your word. As your word is read and proclaimed, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would help us to take something from what we hear and apply it to our lives as we seek to grow closer to Christ and model his ways in the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have three passages of Scripture for us today. The first is Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down and come, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. And then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The second reading comes from Mark 12, verses 41 to 44. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. He called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had to live on. 
And then finally from 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 to 19. As for those who are in the present age rich, command them not to be haughty or set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life which is really life. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Big Daddy was a very rich man. The southern plantation owner had recently received a diagnosis of cancer that would end his life. And so he told his son, I'm a rich man, Brick. Yep, I'm a mighty rich man. Close to 10 million in cash and blue chip stocks. Outside, mind you, of 28,000 acres of the richest land this side of the Valley Nile. But a man can't buy his life with it. He can't buy his life back when his life is finished. He goes on to say, The human animal is a beast that dies. And if he's got money, he buys and buys and buys. And I think the reason he buys everything he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he has the crazy hope that one of his purchases will be life everlasting, which it can never be. These words are from Tennessee Williams' play, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And Big Daddy was right. At the end of his life, he realized that putting his trust in riches was ultimately useless, and that in the process of gaining the whole world, he lost his life. Now, John Wesley understood the danger of wealth. He said, Do you suppose that money though multiplied as the sand of the sea, can give happiness? Then you are given up to a strong delusion to believe a lie, a palpable lie, confuted daily by a thousand experiments in seeking happiness from riches. You are only striving to drink out of empty cups. You know, I, I think deep down we know that it is an illusion to believe that increasing our wealth can satisfy the deepest longings of our souls. To follow this path is indeed to strive to drink out of an empty cup. Now Wesley goes on to say, Let not anyone imagine that he has done anything by gaining and saving all he can if he were to stop there. All this is nothing if a person does not go forward if he does not point all this at a farther end. Nor indeed can a person be said to save anything if he only lays it up. You may as well throw your money into the sea, not to use it, is effectually to throw it away. The third rule to the two, you must add, having first gained all you can and secondly saved all you can, then give all you can. Zacchaeus was a little man with a big bank account. Like Big Daddy, he was very rich. And the people in his town did not like him. But it was not because he was wealthy. You know, people at that time usually thought wealth was evidence of a divine blessing. No, they disliked him because as a chief tax collector, he profited from a corrupt economic system in which he collected more and more taxes to sustain the Roman government, from which he collected a healthy percentage for himself as his pay. Well, Zacchaeus was curious about this man named Jesus who was coming to Jericho. He wanted to see who Jesus was, to see what Jesus was about. However, he was too short to see over the crowds, and the crowds would not let him through to the front, and so he ran ahead and climbed a tree where he was sure to get a glimpse of this man. As Jesus passed by, he noticed Zacchaeus and called to him, Come down, for I must stay at your place tonight. 
what Zacchaeus did and was happy that this holy man would have fellowship with him while the rest of the town's people would not. Well, those people grumbled against Jesus. You know, it was fine that this Jesus guy healed a blind man as he entered Jericho, but now he is associating with this collaborator, this sinner. Well, the grace that Jesus showed to Zacchaeus was so overwhelming and transforming that Zacchaeus responded in a very real and tangible way. He offered to give away half of his wealth and to repay anyone who he defrauded up to four times. Now, it's interesting to note that the law required only two times. His complete change as a result of coming into the presence of Jesus prompted Jesus to observe, Today salvation has come to this house, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Well, like Big Daddy, little Zacchaeus discovered that there is more to life than earning and saving. Though unlike Big Daddy, Zacchaeus experienced salvation. You know, there's this temptation to think that salvation is something that happens to us only after our death. But Scripture makes it clear that salvation is the way that God transforms every area of our lives so that we become part of God's saving work in this world. Salvation changes our hearts by changing the fundamental orientation of our living, including the way we use our money. Zacchaeus came into the presence of Christ. He was transformed and then reoriented his life to become generous. His newfound generosity was in response to the grace that Christ showed him that day. Now, the widow was no Big Daddy or little Zacchaeus. We know she was poor. We know she was a widow. But we don't even know her name. But this poor, nameless widow became a major example of godly stewardship. We read in Scripture that Jesus sat down in the temple across from where people deposited their offering for the temple, and He watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums, but a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Now, we miss something significant in the English translation of the Scripture. In the Greek, there's this little word, P-O-S, which means how or the manner in which. So Jesus sat down and watched how the crowd or the manner in which the crowd was putting money into the treasury. In other words, he was observing the attitude of the giving crowd. Now against the wall in the court of women in the temple were 13 containers called trumpets. And they were probably brass receptacles shaped like a ram's horn, and each of them had a name for their respective offering. The money was also made of metal, so you can imagine uh, that a big offering dropped in these metal containers made quite a racket, calling attention to the person making the gift. The bigger the gift, the greater the noise. Now, given the context of Jesus' comments about those who made a show of their clothes and their prayers from the previous verses we did not read, I think it's fair to assume that the rich of whom Jesus was referring were making a show of how much they were giving. However, the widow gave two mites, or lepta, hardly worth a penny, made of a thin light metal, and her gift might not have even made a noise, and certainly it would not have been noticed. Then Jesus called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Jesus called his disciples over to him because he wanted to focus their attention on what he was about to say. Now this happens a number of times in the Gospels 
when Jesus was about to say something very important. He said, truly I tell you. When Jesus says, truly I tell you in the Bible, it means he's about to make a teaching point that you'd better listen to. The poor widow has put in more than all the others. Which begs the question, how so? And Jesus answers the implied question. Everyone else gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty. Now, it's instructive to learn that the Greek word translated here, abundance, can also be translated remains, or refer to that which is left over after a need is met. The word translated poverty means need or want. So everyone else gave out of their leftovers, their remains, but she gave out of her need and had to give trusting that God would provide for her. So this widow really trusted God. She was really committed to God. She gave of herself sacrificially while others gave what was left over. Clearly, Jesus had a different way of counting the offering that day, and he counted it based not on the size of the gift, but on the impact of the giver. Based not on the difference it made in the temple treasury, but on the difference it made in the giver's life. Jesus said that some of the people that day gave out of their abundance or their remains. In other words, they never felt it. It never made a dent in the way they lived or used their resources. But the woman gave out of her poverty. It had a direct impact on the way she lived the rest of her life. In fact, it represented a total reordering of her existence around her faith in God. Well, with us, as with the widow, Jesus counts our offerings based not on the size of the gift, but on the impact it has on the giver. You see, giving is not primarily about funding the work of the kingdom, though that is a byproduct. Giving is more about our own lives and how they reflect our faith and how giving transforms us to be more God-centered and God-trusting. Giving out of our need in response to God's blessings reorders our lives around God. In other words, giving is good for our souls. Now this has been confirmed by some secular research done by a New York Times columnist, Nicholas Kristof, and his wife, Cheryl Wooden. They studied patterns of giving and discovered that giving is good for us and can be a source of joy. They used neuroscience to demonstrate that we experience a happiness boost from our efforts to help other people. Now this idea that joy can come from being generous is exhibited in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. We all know this story of the self-absorbed greedy man who is transformed into a person who finds joy in giving his wealth away to help others. Well, in all his sermons on money, Wesley affirmed the importance of providing for personal and family needs. Life is better when we have what Wesley called things needful for yourself, your family, your servants, or any others who pertain to your household. But Wesley was equally clear that simply earning and saving all you can could become a barrier to growing to perfection as a follower of Christ unless these first two practices were a beginning of a move to a farther end of a life of Christ centered in generosity, where we find joy in giving all we can. The urgency behind Wesley's sermon, The Use of Money, was his pastoral desire to lead people into a healthier, more productive, more deeply Christ-centered life by providing the practical wisdom on the relationship between their faith and their finances. And Wesley's three rules for the use of money 
earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can, well, where they were not about raising money for the church. They were there to help the listener to become more like Jesus. The further end toward which Wesley sought to move followers of Jesus is a life that fulfills God's best purpose for the use of our resources and equips us to participate in God's loving, saving, healing work in this world. The further end to which we are called is nothing less than using our money as the practical means by which we participate in God's kingdom coming on earth. Now, as we come to the close of this year's stewardship emphasis, let me contrast the difference between charitable giving and Christian generosity or Christian stewardship. Charitable giving can happen in a moment, but Christian stewardship takes a lifetime. Charitable giving flows out of our abundance, but Christian stewardship changes the financial priorities by which we live. Effective charity is measured by the difference it makes for the ones who receive it, but Christian stewardship is measured by the difference it makes in the life of the giver. Charitable giving is a compassionate response to an immediate need. Christian stewardship is a spiritual discipline that enables the disciple to grow to the farther end of a life that is fully grown and measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. So as we conclude, each of us are left with this one question. How far will you go? May God bless us as we seek to honor Him by earning all we can, saving all we can, and giving all we can to God's glory. Thanks be to God, and amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you this day knowing that you promise to hear us when we pray. When we struggle to find the words or cannot articulate our longings, hopes, and fears, we trust that you know our needs even when we are unable to speak them aloud. We rest in your presence, trusting your compassion, rejoicing in your covenant love that refuses to let us go. We pray that the church would be a near reflection of its head, Jesus Christ. When the world roils in violence, make of us peacemakers. When the oppressed cry out for help, send us to bring good news in the form of justice and relief. When your children are hungry, help us to feed your sheep. May our unity in Christ be leaven for reconciliation and healing in our communities. We pray for the welfare of the world. We do not want to neglect any corner of creation because all the earth belongs to you, Lord God, and you named every inch of it good. As we live and move and have our being in you, reveal to us how to tend and nurture all you have entrusted to us. Knowing that you make us stewards of that which does not belong to us, we ask for the courage to use all we have for your sake and in your service. We pray for all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, those known to all of us, those we hold silently and confidentially in our hearts, and those known only to you. Bring healing, wholeness, relief, and peace to those most in need of your presence and love. We pray for ourselves, 
that we would better love you and neighbor with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, over the past few weeks, we have been hearing from different folks in our church speak about the grace of God that they've experienced by being a part of this wonderful church. Now, today we will hear from Tim Grine, whose family roots go all the way back to 1859 and the first pastor of this church, his great-great-grandfather, the Reverend Hunter Dalton. Family connection and legacy are important to Tim's experience of faith here at our church. 164 years ago, <clears throat> my grandfather, times four, helped found the First Presbyterian Church of High Point. Since that time, this church has been home to our family. Growing up, I recall my grandfather attending ses session meetings almost as if he never rotated off. He was the moderator of the centennial celebration of the church and the vice moderator for the church's 125th celebration. My grandmother was heavily involved in the history of First Presbyterian Church of High Point, helping to co-write the second version of the history of First Presbyterian Church. Growing up, I can recall Christmas and Easter services where we had to put folding chairs in the aisles to accommodate everyone. Sunday school on Sundays was packed with kids running all over church from 1045 after Sunday school let out until the 11 a.m. service began. The youth program was overflowing with participants. <clears throat> I sang in the youth choirs and there was barely enough room on the risers for everyone. The Wednesday night supper in the fellowship hall was packed and the scouting program which I was a part of, was one of the biggest and best in the triad. We were spitting out Eagle Scouts like they were coming out of a Pez dispenser. I've attended the funerals of both of my grandparents at this church, seen lots of children baptized. But my best memory comes about 16 years ago when I brought the girl I was dating to church. It was then that Allison informed me that every time she passed this church as a child with her parents, she said she wanted to get married here. Maybe she was just saying that as partly coercion. However, I choose to believe it. As we began our journey together, we had a little girl named Lilibeth who was baptized here and whose voice cannot be mistaken as you hear her coming through the halls. Those that came before us felt a commitment to ensure that this church was here for future generations. And it's our job now to do the same. Over the last 18 to 24 months, I have felt a calling to step into the shoes of those before me and make sure that my daughter has the same experiences that I had growing up. This church is a community, and our pledges go to instill that we have a great community experience. Without those pledges, who funds the children's programs, music programs, and the other church activities that we all enjoy? Without those programs and activities, how do we grow our congregation and build it back to what it was 30 years ago. As a congregation, we are in a blessed situation because our church is debt-free. So the money that many churches use to pay off debt can now go to fund 
church functions, and community outreach. On Thanksgiving Day in 1946, this church building was dedicated and became debt-free after many years of struggling through the Great Depression. In the history of First Presbyterian Church of High Point, it lists some of the donors and what their contributions were. My great-grandfather, for example, gave $10.00. Sanders Dallas's father gave $30. It wasn't much, but it helped this church through one of the most difficult financial times in American history. As we approach the anniversary of this dedication, I would urge you to consider the sacrifice that those made in that time and see how it can apply today. It is my desire to one day, hopefully many years from now, walk my daughter down the aisles of church and watch future generations run through the halls on Sunday. I hope that you have the same vision as me and will consider this when making your pledges for 2022. My daughter, Little Beth, and future generations, thank you. First Presbyterian has offered Tim the opportunity to express his musical gifts in our first worship service and continue the legacy of his ancestors by raising his own family in the faith here at the church. And it is your partnership in giving that allows our church to be such a place of faith formation and service for folks like Tim. So on behalf of our church, let me say thank you so much and may God bless you. In God's great goodness, God provides for what we need. And as a way of responding in thanksgiving to this loving provision, we bring our gifts to God. And then God uses what we give to bless the world through us. Each one of us has an important part to play in how God chooses to meet the needs of the world. And so, as part of our worship, let us bring our offering to Almighty God, and you may do so either through our online giving links on our church website or by mailing them into the church office. Let me say thank you on behalf of our shared ministry together. and say you're beautiful oh, 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 oh. you're beautiful oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh I see out in the moonlit night Where planets are in motion Galaxies are bright We are amazed in the light of the stars They're all proclaiming who you are You're beautiful, oh Let it 
begging for me Now you are sitting on your heavenly throne Soon we will be going home You're As you go from this place today, let us remember the wise words of John Wesley. Earn all you can from honest industry and wisdom. Save all you can through good stewardship and prudence. And then give all you can to bless the world around you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.